Welcome to the Help My Unbelief podcast, the number one Christian podcast designed for the unbeliever. What's up, guys? Hey, I am so <laughs> excited we're back. You are? Yes. Did you did you miss it while we're gone? Did you really miss it? Or? Drastically, dude. Yeah? Yeah. It threw my whole week off. Yeah. I even actually ended up missing Ambassador twice. Yeah, you never miss Ambassador. Nope, I do not. And yeah. I'm, I mean, I was working, but still, I didn't like it. Uh, yeah. It felt like not getting loaded. Yeah. And then we had the men's conference last weekend. So, technically, all right, I made it to Ambassadors last week. Then church on Wednesday night. Then I was up here for prayer, or uh, set up on Thursday night. Then I was here most of the day on Friday, or I guess I got here about what? I think I had to be here at 3 or 3.30, something like that. And then all day Saturday. And then Sunday, I was out in El Reno. Plus, I had meetings. I was in this church other than an hour and a half all day Sunday. Yeah. All day Sunday. I was in meeting after meeting after meeting. Pastor Gary's here, by the way. Sir. Yes. For all for all that's um, listening and not watching, Pastor Gary's here in studio. Thanks for coming back. We appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's a, I know it's all it's always our favorites when he comes in because it's like very much. You're at a place where we would like aspire to be. Like when you talk to people, we're like, oh man, I hope I can be like that someday. Well, you know. I, well, appreciate that. You're very very kind. Um, I think it's exciting to get back though. Yeah, me too. We so. are actually in your class every Wednesday night, mm-hmm. and I'm telling you, there there's a lot of talk afterward with a lot of the guys from my men's class on Sunday. There's a lot of talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Good. you, I love your teacher's heart in it, that you explain things to us in quite yeah. a clear, understanding way. You know how to, because it's really cool. Like, one thing that I texted this to you, but I haven't been able to talk to you about it yet, but, like, Right before your Holy Spirit class, like I was literally looking at the Holy Spirit like he was a bully, like he was picking on me, like he was always wanting me to do something I didn't want to do. Um, I was looking at him like like a drill sergeant, like something, something like that. And then you had a class called Holy Spirit, my friend, yeah. you know. And we started, I started looking at that different, differently, like, oh, like this is, this is God and he's not there to hurt you. Like he's there to everything he does. It's for a reason. It's not because he's trying to make you uncomfortable or make you feel bad. The Holy Spirit's your friend. And that really changed my walk with my daily walk with God. It was well, something good. practical. Cause see the Holy Spirit is there to help. Yeah. And honestly, to be our friend. Yeah. Personal relationship. Yeah, it's all comes back to that. Yeah, oh, I've been learning quite a bit about that, especially right before the men's conference. It seemed like I several times become overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit as I was preparing for the men's conference. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have a speaking part at all. You know, I was just talking with the guys. But the Lord led me to several that actually gave their heart to the Lord this weekend. And I'm like blown away. Excited. So good. So yeah, and see the objective here with this podcast is for us to be able to show people who don't agree with us, people who don't even believe in our God, that we as Christians are approachable, Mm -hmm. that we care for them, we love them. Yeah, Uh, and even though we don't agree, and even though we may find it difficult to find common ground, the fact is, is we still love them. We want to talk to them. We want them to be able to be open with us and us communicate back with them and that have that interaction so critical. And to me, that's one of the beautiful things about this podcast. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing is like, I was talking to Coco's son last week. Right. And sometimes, sometimes I make it look like being a Christian is hard or not fun, you know, and stuff like that. And I can't remember what he said, but it gave me an opportunity. Like, I think we got to show people that being a Christian, you can be cool. It's cool. It's cool to follow God. It's cool to follow the will of God. It's it's purposeful. I have a purpose. You know, it's just like I went into a live with three other atheists the other day. A, a live like on a TikTok where it was a live, um, how do you call that? Like a show, basically. And I got invited to one of the atheist show. And I as I went up there, 
two of the atheists that we've had on the show before were like, please wait. So I want to tell Zach something before I go off. And I was like, okay. And I get up there and both of them were like, please don't quit what you're doing. Wow. And that just blew. And Coco even told me like, you know, I told Coco, I was, I was honest, like on the break it, you know, ministry's hard. It's it, just like Pastor Kevin said a couple weeks ago. Ministry isn't for weenies. It's not for, you know, weak-minded people. Ministry's hard. And and it proved to me that on on that this break that it would be easy for me to just walk away, run my company, do all this stuff. Um and so but hearing that encouragement from atheist like even they can see, they can see that there's a purpose in this, whether they may not believe in the source of the purpose, but they can see the purpose. Yeah. And that meant a lot to me. That meant a lot to me that we have purpose now, you know? So I want to get right into um, some questions for Pastor Gary, because b- before we left, we all were um, kind of um, having some questions about theology and stuff like that. And we wanted to bring you on to just, put all that stuff to bed and hear it from a pastor's point of view. Um, the biggest one was hell. That's why I wish Mark was here. Um, and so my question for you is, is I'm going to put you in the hot seat That's already. Funny. That's fine. He, he's like, I've been doing this. I'm, for used, you. I'm used to it. Um, <laughs> we should address real quick why Mark isn't here. Oh okay. yeah. Because I mean, we don't want him to think that Mark quit. Yeah. yeah. Mark is, he's just doing his TV thing. He's got work. Thank the Lord. So Amen. he's out working. Yeah, yeah. Mark will be back. Mark actually did the show order today for us. And, and I just had to, um, just had to say it. So Mark's fully, um, in his job and he's actually an executive producer now. So he's even more involved in the show than what he was before. He just, just like normal Mark's gone. Sometimes it's just the normal Mark's right. gone, but we miss so, him. Yeah. We miss you, Mark. But I'm sure the Lord will allow him to come back next week. So, um, but the whole issue of hell that has made me so uncomfortable, um, whenever, cause I'm, you know, in ministry, we're ministering to unbelievers like Coco and his son and stuff like that. And I get real close. I get real close to them and it makes me like, I start looking at God, like, how could you send them to hell? These are my friends. You know, I love these people yeah. and it makes me uncomfortable to even think about. And then I, that makes me to kind of start turning on God a little bit, if that makes sense, where I'm like, don't, don't send my friends to hell, you know? So the question is, how could a loving God send someone to hell? Does that make sense? That's very good. It's a great question. And the position I'd like for you and Larry to take is as I share some thoughts, because I did prepare because you told me to come prepared. Yeah. And as I share thoughts, you don't hesitate to maybe even take a, a different perspective and to challenge me. Okay. Because I, I want to be clear, and I because to me this is about as critical a topic as we can deal with. Uh, the reality is, is every one of us are going to live forever in one of two places, and I believe that it's either heaven or a place of punishment. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you would, I want to start, though. One of the things that I really want people to understand is there's a difference between my opinion and my belief. Um, I have some opinions, personal opinions, that are honestly contrary to my beliefs. Uh, For example, my opinion is I hate war. There should not be war. My opinion, babies should never die. My opinion is there should not be such a thing as a pediatrics intensive care unit. Anybody yeah, you agree? You know? I agree. And so I've got an opinion there. And my opinion is I wish there was no hell. Um, I don't believe any Christian should delight in the reality that there is eternal punishment. My, my opinion is I don't want anyone to go to an everlasting place of punishment. That's my opinion. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, many times my opinion comes in conflict with my belief. And so what I've got to do is recognize God really doesn't care about my opinion, Mm -hmm. you know, because he's God and I'm not. Amen. And so what I have to do is is this. I've got to bring my opinion into obedience to God's plan, to God's purpose, and to God's design, because he's God, I'm not. So just a couple of things in my opinion is, one is, I wish there was not a hell, personal opinion. Uh, I would I would love for everybody to go to a eternal place of nothing but reward, blessings of the Lord. 
Mm -hmm. I, I think it'd be great if everybody did. Uh, another personal opinion is I'm no one's judge. I'm not a judge. None of us are judges, and thank God we're not. Amen. Uh, that's way past our pay grade. Another is I view heaven and hell from a perspective like parenting, okay? And and I use the phrase hell, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it in a moment because, honestly, the word hell is wrong. That's the wrong word to use in what we're talking about. We're talking about eternal punishment, and hell's not really the good word to use, and, and I'll share with that in a moment. But my personal view of heaven and eternal punishment is that it's like parenting. Um, in parenting, if all it is is reward, 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 everybody's going to heaven, reward, 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 we're going to raise kids with a warped sense of identity, expecting you do what's right, and you're going to expect reward out of doing a, a welfare mentality. Yeah. What, whatever I do, expect good out of it because I did what's right, you know, and that's not good parenting. We have to balance in parenting reward with punishment. Yes. You know, I'll give you a reward if you, you know, clean up your room, if you do what's right, you know, on your way home from church, if you, you know, be good, we'll stop by Brahms, you know, reward. And then sometimes we use the punishment, you know, uh, we try to balance them out. If it's all punishment, 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 you're going to warp that kid's self-esteem and self-image and you're, you'll destroy him. So the point is in parenting, we balance reward and punishment and God as father is the same. It's reward or punishment. And you obey him, you follow his precepts, you obey his word, and uh, you bring your life, get my opinions, and bring my opinions into submission to him, then he's God of my life, and I expect his reward. If I reject him, deny him, if I rebel against him, then I can expect his punishment. And, and it's just to me, it's just simple understanding. If I it's just the up, way it is. It is. And it doesn't matter what my opinion is. It honestly goes against my opinion and my personal preference. Because mm -hmm. my personal preference would, honestly, I, me and my heart, I wish everybody went to heaven. Everyone had an eternal reward. Yes. Uh, I would love it for everybody to go. And I don't care what name you come up with, Os Osama bin Laden or Hitler. Man, it would be just great if everybody went to this eternal reward. But that's my opinion. Yeah, and my opinion is different than my belief because my belief has to be have some type of guideline to where I can come up with these beliefs and I can know what's right, what's wrong, and I need an unchanging standard, an absolute, an absolute. And to me, that's God's word. Yeah, and that's I was talking to Coco last week in my kitchen, and I got teared up, and I was I was telling him, and I'm grateful that he's an atheist, and he allows me to navigate my life with a. Uh, belief in God. And there's a, there's this age old question. And I want you to comment on this question as well, because I have an answer just from like a spiritual standard. And I know you probably have one from a biblical standard. And the question is, how do you know that what I believe in, what you believe in, what you believe in the help man believe podcast, what we're trying to reach for? How do we know that this is the right one? That paganism isn't witchcraft isn't that Zeus isn't that um, the other thousands of gods or the you know even I read the book of Jonah and there was a bunch of people on that boat that Jonah was on and they but they served other gods and then because Jonah's God was so mad they realized that that God was more powerful and they threw Jonah off overboard because they wanted him away from because his God was different than ours right and so how do we know that I'm on the right track that you're on the right track that He's the one true God. Because he knows all. Can I give you my opinion on that? Well, let me finish mine and then you give your I want let me finish mine real quick. Hold on. So my mine is is because in the spiritual realm, I know what I have to do to get these spiritual attacks to stop. I know. I know what would happen if I stopped doing the podcast. I know exactly what would happen. And I know I know what happens when I push forward in the plan of God. I know exactly what happens. I've experienced it too long. I may be a baby Christian in the church and stuff like that, but I've been speaking to God and following the Holy Spirit and moving towards his plan for a very long time. And I know when Satan backs off and I know when he pushes forward. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've delved into that spiritual realm so much that I know when I'm on the right track is that's when Satan tries to derail us. You don't think this was the hardest week? To get back to this show, mm -hmm. 
You know why? Mm-hmm. It's pretty clear. It's it's almost as, as apparent as if he was right in front of you and just talking to you and telling you what he was trying to do. Mm-hmm. Almost. Yeah, I but, mean, right there. Yeah, but I guarantee you Satan showed you that you got rain the next couple of days and you're giving up a sunny day to come in here exactly when you need to be on a road way more than that yeah. even way I, yeah, more than I know. that i mean that's he tried to drive a wedge between me and him yeah. because of me and him monday, go under monday yeah. big time i mean like because i was full of the lord all weekend long and i'm in victory when i wake up on monday morning Satan and we attack. haven't had to argue that and we boom, haven't boom, had boom. an argument in months and he's just ramping it up but to me it's a reverse compliment Yes. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. really when the enemy comes against you, it's a compliment. Mm-hmm. And the compliment is he recognizes that you're a threat to his kingdom. Yeah. That you're you're being used by God to accomplish a purpose. Yeah. If if the enemy doesn't bother you, that's an insult. Well, well it's I, like I actually did take it as a compliment because I was sitting because of all the things that I had to do that day. I was actually sitting in the uh, um, risers right there at the beginning, and the guy speaking on. Uh, Oh, I lost his name. Uh, not not Heath, but the other one. Micah. Micah. When Micah was speaking, he asked for somebody, you know, are you going to, you know, stand up for the Lord? I stood up and said, here, I I mean, it wasn't about the Lord. It was, are you going to stand against Satan? And I stood up. I'm right here. Yeah. Here I am, Lord, use me. I mean, like. Boy, I, boy, so when I, I called first. Him, I called him out, and then Monday morning, he answered with an yeah. attack. And I instantly recognized. See, there's a difference. I instantly recognized it was an attack of Satan. And. We got sideways in a conversation, and I said, I'm not, I'm not talking to you right now because I'm afraid. I, and he asked me why, and I said, because I'm afraid I'm going to answer in the flesh, and I'm trying to answer in the spirit. Yeah. And if there's those two battles are going on inside you, you need to shut it down. Took a few days and off, it, squared to, it away, yep, and so To answer your question, why I believe in, in the God one. that yeah. I believe in is because he's the only God that, died, that sent his son to die. There's not another God out there in any form or fashion of religion of any sort that died for you mm-hmm. to reconcile you. Everything else is done on what you can do. Yeah. Not what on what God did for us. And I want to say this too. Like I've been that? seeing a lot of videos. How about that, Gary? No, I love that. Very good. I want to say this too. Um, I've been seeing a lot of videos of atheists uh, saying it's been a popular topic lately where atheists will say, be like, okay, so what? He gave up a weekend. They say he gave up a weekend because he was resurrected in three days. We die and we go away forever. Jesus gave up a weekend. And I'm like, I don't think, I don't think that was the worst part of what Jesus experienced was physical death. No, I really don't. I think because it says that Jesus became sin for us. And I think the worst part that he had experienced and which nobody in here will ever get to experience because you're experiencing your own sin throughout your life and your own separation from God, but you still get an advocate and a gift that gets to spend. You still get a piece of God here on earth, but Jesus felt complete and utter separation from God. His father he turned poured his out, face away. He poured out all sin on Jesus in the cross. Right. And I bet that's the single most uncomfortable feeling that a human being has ever felt ever yep. right the, there. The total abandonment of God at that particular point. Would you as, agree with as that? All, as would. all of our sins are poured on. And the us. thing is, he who knew no sin became sin, yes. that we could be the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah. And Peter says that he took our sin and nailed it to the cross. In other words, he literally took within himself all of our sin. All of it. And then it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. And the reality is right then he became sin. So much more than death, right? Uh, so to much me, more. that was the greatest suffering. And really, you could say even Gethsemane. To me, Gethsemane was a great suffering also because he had to come to the will of the Father. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that was a great suffering. He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. That's Luke. Yeah. And what we find in it, there is literally a physical um, uh, description of being under such pressure that the capillaries underneath the surface of your skin will burst and out of the pores of your skin will come blood. It's because he knew what he was going to have to do. And he was literally suffering at that time. Yeah. But let let me go back to your question, because we were just comparing belief for belief, belief for belief, because honestly, the belief in the death of Jesus Christ, for our that's our belief. Mm -hmm. If we compare our belief to Buddha or to Confucius or to atheist or to agnostic or pagan, whatever, I believe that the difference is, is this. It tells me in Romans chapter 8, that spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. 
Yes. And so there's something taking place inside of me, in my spirit man, that it's convincing me that this is right, that mm-hmm. this is God dwelling in me. His spirit bears witness with my spirit. And what uh, the challenge that I give people, if they're pagan, atheist, or agnostic, whatever, give God a try. You know, give God a month. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Mean it from the depth of your heart and really, really mean it and give God a month. And I've had people that have taken me on the challenge. They say, okay, I'll, I'll give God a month. And the reality is, is at that end of that month, you will never go back to anything other than living for God. Yeah. Because that spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. But an authentic relationship with God, not what you see in maybe what your church is. Because t- I've been really thinking about this on the break. And what I experienced, what I was experiencing, and I thank my mom. She helped me and she didn't even know it. I mean, she was doing drugs and all this other stuff. And I, I know that my church was not spiritual at all. And I grew up there and I always said, I didn't have a negative experience there, but I was experiencing God in a different way than I was being taught. And I knew I was different with those people and I just couldn't do it. Like they, they promote prayer and stuff, but it's just very standardized and stuff like that. And then you come to church here and it's like, we're communicating with the Holy Spirit and you're navigating your life. We're going to put our hands on people. Very spiritual. Well, my mom told me when I was younger, um, I was real scared of thunderstorms. And she said, uh. She said, it's just, don't worry, Zach. It's just God and Jesus. They're bowling up there in heaven. And I remember going up to my room that really night, that night, and I was just scared to death. And I started talking to Jesus. I said, are you guys bowling up there? Who's winning? And I'd start talking to him. And that started on my spiritual journey with them. And I navigated a different relationship with God than what my church, my Baptist church was experiencing. And it was very spiritual. And when I finally came here, I found this church. I was like, oh, there's other people like me. And I loved it. I loved it. That's why, I, that's why I'm, say, I'm saying all this to say that you have a relationship with God. You, by yourself. Not like you're, maybe not like, I'm not, not all churches are doing what they're supposed to. Can we agree on that? And I don't want to bash on your church, but have a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. You, by yourself, not like how Benny Hinn showing you on TV, not like your church is maybe showing you. Cause I'm not saying your church is, I don't know, but you talk to Jesus, you communicate with him. And what I've seen is how God talks to me and he always confirms it. It takes time for him to talk and confirm that it was him. He's not going to always answer you right back, but when he speaks and he caps that off with the golf ball story or the sparrow, and stuff like that, the story that I've told you guys before, you know it's him, and it's special, and it's always, so, it's such a special, and you should try it for a month, because if you invite him, he will he will come, and he will be there, and it's the most glorious thing in the world, and it doesn't doesn't have to be like your church is showing you, because it may, that might not be the right way. So The very first challenge that I made to my wife, Darcia, was, hey, let's shut that iPod off, Turn on Kayla for a month. We'd listen to it in the car. We don't listen to any secular music. All we do is listen to this in the background. I remember you we said added that. 90, we had it on 100% of the time, 24-7. I said, do this for a month for me. It's still on Kayla. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, okay. Here, um, it is. here it is, six years I later. got another <laughs> question. Um, oh, my gosh, don't tell me. I just lost it. Okay. All right, I got it. Can't have a senior moment um, when you're sitting with two seniors. So <laughs> my, my most uncomfortable part about about me um, bearing my soul on this podcast the last year, the struggles, and I know God had a reason for allowing me to do that because I've gotten emails, messages, and stuff, and there's a lot more people that's experiencing these things that are just like me, and they yeah, thank fine. me for doing that. So I'm grateful that I went through that. But always when I, when I was younger and I communicate with God and stuff like that, there was one thing that was for sure. And that was that I was never going to, you'd have to kill me for me to ever doubt um, in God. I always had that special relationship with him. Well, since I started this ministry and I started to have those doubts and stuff, and I'm sure you heard it on there, um, it killed me. It killed me that I was doubting that I was starting to um, doubt my beliefs and stuff like that. It killed me. And sometimes I would scream at God and I'd say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you allowing this? Stop, stop, come closer to me. Like, stop 
doing this. Just stop making me. I don't like this. I hate this. Stop, stop, stop. And I'm begging God to stop. My unbelief during that time did not feel like a choice. It didn't feel like a choice at all. It felt like it was something that was happening to me. And I speak to a lot of atheists now that say the same thing. They say that their unbelief isn't a choice. They, they view it as unbelief as something that happened to them, you know, and I have no answer to that. I don't even have an, a direct line to how that could be. The only thing I can say is there was some choices I made, especially if you're in ministry. I mean, there's some choices I made that led to me not believing at that time. So the question, let me sum it down for you. Just wanted to share my experience is belief a choice or is it not a choice? Well, to, to deal exactly with what you, you shared, you were a Christian dealing with doubt. Yeah. And the reality is, is our God is big enough to stand up to our doubt. Mm -hmm. All of us have doubted. Anybody that would say, I've never dealt with unbelief would lie to you about something else. Because the reality is, all of us, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, but one of the things about doubt is every time you work through it, you become, I'd say you're stronger in the Lord now than you were prior. Yeah. Before. Mm -hmm. Because you were a Christian, and I believe sometimes the Lord uh, in his sovereignty allows things to come into our lives that causes us to grow and develop, just like raising your kids. Um, not everything Development does not come from everything being easy. Development comes from resistance. Yeah. You know, I used to manage health clubs, and the more you uh, have resistance, you build and work through it. Okay, and the same thing with Christianity. God, God is a good father. He corrects his children. He chastises us. And a lot of that chastisement is building character, building strength, building devotion. Yeah. When you have an unbeliever, like you said, dealing with unbelief, and they don't have the Holy Spirit at work inside of them. They don't have God and a belief that in God. And they find themselves being lied to by the enemy, that you have no choice but unbelief. Yeah. I, I believe to me that's a lie of the enemy. It's a deceit, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's the enemy trying to so get a hold of their lives that they feel like they're in a locked-in condition, and I have no way out of this. And people, when people feel hopeless, like they have no answer, that's when they're at their most vulnerable. Yeah. And so what we try to do as Christians is communicate to them, you do have an answer. There is an option here. And in counseling, people who are suicidal, they literally come to the place of believing they have no hope. There, there's no answer here. I have no way out of this. And, and when the enemy so lies to them like that, then he gets them to the place, well, if there's no hope and there's no answer, then I might as well. Yeah. You know. And yeah. so the reality is that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to take anybody down that path of unbelief. There's no way out of this. There's no hope for you, and there's no answer for you. And then, well, you might as well take your life. Yeah, just, yeah. Kill, steal, and destroy. That's his ultimate goal. That's why I was talking to Coco about, um, because Coco's uh, currently an unbeliever, and he's a very intelligent person, very intelligent person. And I, he asked me some question that got me talking about this, and and I was like, that's why I believe that we're ministering to the most difficult group of individuals in the world, because if what I believe in is true, then, then you would, for you to come back, you have to admit that you've been tricked, that you've been deceived, that you've been, you know, and that's one of those like give and takes, like I've got to admit that I got tricked, but I'm smart, you know, and that's the truth. Like, um, I, I think you can probably say this. Well, you can, that's a perfect topic though, right there, uh -huh. because what you're talking about is pride. Yeah. And pride is an enemy for all of us. And yeah. I don't care. I mean, you've been a Christian for 150 years, whatever. All of us have a pride issue. Yeah. You know, and the old enemy loves to exalt that pride. And, mm -hmm. you know, pride will keep you from doing a lot of things yeah. in, in obedience to God. I probably get tricked currently by Satan. I would like, I would say daily. Like, he tricks me into thinking a certain way tricks me into believing that this is true and it's a lie. Like the enemy tricks me every day. That is hard to admit. You know, you've got to learn the, the, um, the schemes of Satan too. He's your enemy. He's trying to, he's trying to get you daily. And hey, Zach. what? Hey Zach. Hey Zach. Yeah. Is that really how it is? Yeah. Are you really that way? Yeah. Every day. I don't see it. You're such a complete failure. 
Yeah, he doesn't sound that corny in my head, but, but no, I'm no, kidding. But I mean, hey, listen, it's the whispers of the enemy yeah. that constantly create doubt, constantly create issues within ourselves, constantly says that can't possibly be how it is. And we choose to either hear him yeah, or resist him. I want to say, I was having a, are we ready? Are we, Fifteen minutes. He wants to yeah. get some of his ten points oh, he's got some points. Yeah. Okay, if you okay. want me, I sure, mean, yeah, please. Of course, I don't want to talk about hell, but <laughs> you know, no, I oh think, boy, I get well, to talk here, about let hell. Let me ask you a question. Well, okay, yeah, okay, I get okay. asked this question a lot. All right, You're fine. Why would God send people to hell? And the reality is, God does not send people to hell. The real. Uh, and let's talk a moment about hell, okay? And the word hell, and this is a little bit of just a back study. The word hell is 19 times in the Old Testament when you just look for the word hell. In the New Testament, the word hell appears 13 times, and 11 of them are spoken by Jesus. So in the New Testament, Jesus speaks more about hell than anybody. And James one time and in, the, in Peter one time. When you look at the word Hades, it's 11 times and all of it in the New Testament. Hades refers to death and the grave. It's not literally this eternal punishment. And hell is not the literal eternal punishment. That's not what that is. Uh, if you would, lake of fire is the better understanding of eternal punishment. Lake of fire appears four times all in Revelation all in Revelation, because it's talking about the conclusion, the lake of fire. If you will, <clears throat> everlasting fire is used two times, and both of them are by Jesus. And so what we find is the Old Testament hell comes from a Hebrew word, sheol. Uh -huh, and yep. Sheol, yeah. and literally it refers to the grave or a pit. Yep. Excuse me. When we come to the New Testament, the word hell is translated from a Greek word, Gehenna. And there's literally a place called Gehenna outside of Jerusalem, which is a place of burning. Yeah. And it's, for our understanding, it's a trash heap. Yeah, I've heard okay. of that. Yeah. Okay, that's Gehenna. And so really when you, you use the word hell or Hades, it's not really what you're really talking about, because for the most part, what we say is we're talking about eternal punishment. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about eternal reward, heaven, or eternal punishment, which would be literally the lake of fire. Because when we read, in, in if you will, in Revelation 20 and 14, it says that death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. That's the eternal punishment, the lake of fire. Uh, what I see is, I love Matthew 25 and 41, and it says, then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So what I see is, is this everlasting fire was never created for man. God never intended man to go to this everlasting punishment. That was never God's design. God's design was for man to be able to commute with him uh, in the cool of the day. God to have a perfect relationship of innocence with man. Uh, if you really want to know how God intended it to be, Look at the garden. You know, look at up to chapter 3, mm -hmm. chapter 1, 2 of Genesis. And that's how God intended it. But God had to create this place called everlasting fire, Matthew 25 and 41, prepared for the devil and his angels. Because when Lucifer fell, he drew with him one-third of the stars of heaven. And, and when he fell, there had to be this place of punishment for them. So God, God doesn't send anyone to this lake of fire. Everyone deserves it, earns mm -hmm. it. You earn your passage to the lake of fire in your resistance, rejection, denial of God. Why can't there be no forgiveness for Satan and the angels that fell with him? Why can there be no forgiveness? Why can there not be? Is that what you're asking? Or, or why, why could there not be? No. Why is there not? any forgiveness for them. That's why he created it because they they're actually eternal. They are not they're the same as our souls. They are eternal. They're not trapped in a physical body, but because they will never 
be able to move away from what they've done. Well, they right? were always I mean, spiritual, right? They always have been spiritual. Yeah. They're, they've never been human. And see, to me, a lot of the problem with the angels happened long before the creation of mankind. Correct. Okay. It, it happened, uh, if you remember in Luke, Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven mm -hmm. and like lightning. And when we look in Genesis, we find that in Genesis chapter 3, Satan was in the garden and appeared as a serpent. Right. Remember? So the big question would be, when did Satan fall from heaven? It was sometime between the creation of the earth and the fall of man. So we know in that time period that there was somewhere there that Satan fell from heaven because we know he was here in Genesis 3. We know also, well, and honestly, it doesn't have to be prior to the creation of the earth because it could have even been prior to that as far as when he, but we know that it had to be before Genesis chapter 3 because he's here. Right. Okay. He's already on the pro on the property and, and yeah, he was, away. Yeah. Yep. In, now, personal opinion, when the it, when you look at Genesis chapter 1, it says that the earth was void and without form. And then, of course, we come up with dinosaurs and different things. Personal opinion, and this is just opinion, I believe that Satan took his hand at creation. And I believe that Satan attempted cr to create. And that was the thing that did not last. There was darkness and void. And then people talk about the Ice Age and, and different things. And, and I have no problem with people believing in that because I believe that there was a time period in which there was a chaos upon the planet. And, then, and that, a lot, I think, was instigated by Satan himself. But what we've got to understand is, is all this fall of Satan, Lucifer, and the angels happened a long time prior to Calvary. Now, Jesus has always been, mm -hmm. but Jesus was in heaven with the Father. Uh, Jesus, of course, came and, and he lived the life, the 33 years, and he died on the cross of Calvary. And, but what it tells us also, and, and I pulled up these scriptures also, that he went to the place and he preached to the dead saints, okay, in this holding place. And so Which is the Sheol or whatever, right? Yeah. Yes, and it and it's a temporary holding place, not eternal punishment. Yeah. Uh, in Luke chapter sixteen it's called uh, if you remember with me, uh, there was a, a man in Luke sixteen and it says, And being in torments in Hades. Those are that there's people there right now. Well, uh, ultimately Death and Hades, hell, Get will be cast. thrown into the lake of yeah. fire, ultimately. They're not there now. There's a holding place. Yeah. Okay. Now, that there was a holding place prior for all the Old Testament saints. And it tells us that Christ went to this holding place and preached to them the gospel. Uh, and if you will, that's in Second Peter chapter 2, 8 and 9. Uh, and it says, uh, or excuse me, uh, in First Peter 4 and 5. It says, for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. Uh, that's First uh, Peter 4 and 5. And so what we needed, there's only one way to God the Father, and it's through Christ the Son. Right. There's only one way of forgiveness, and it's through Jesus Christ. And Abraham and all the Old Testament needed a way to the Father. And that's why, again, when we talk about Hades and hell and the grave, and, and th that's why a lot of times there's so much confusion. But it, literally, we're talking about eternal lake of fire. There was this holding place. Jesus went there, preached to them. And then, if you will, and I know this is probably far more than you want, but in Matthew 27, verse 52, it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised from the dead. Okay, what that tells us is, is that when Jesus arose from the dead, he conquered death, he conquered the grave, he went and preached to those saints, and then they participated in in his resurrection. Oh, that's why I was reading that. I told you, like, I thought that was one of the weirdest Bible verses I had read. I remember read. that conversation. But there's also an addition to that um, Bible verse, too, where it said, like, some people actually witnessed them walking around yeah, on the earth or something. Yeah, that's the next verse. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the Holy City and appeared to many. What's that? Uh, that's so, Matthew 27 and 52. No, but, like, 53. what was that? What's that about? That that What that is is Jesus, during that Three days. Okay, Jesus was very busy the three days from the death on the cross pretty, to the yeah. resurrection. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first place he went was to the temple because at the moment of death, the veil of the temple yes. tore from top to bottom. Top to bottom. Hebrews 9 and 10 tells us what he did. 
It says that not with the blood of bulls or goats, with the sprinkling of ashes of heifers, but with his own precious blood, he entered once into the holiest of holies and laid himself down as the perfect sacrifice for all mankind. So Jesus, that's where he went first. Mm -hmm. The next place he went. No, you're good. You're good. Go ahead. The next place he went was to this holding place. Uh And And he preached the gospel to Abraham, to Moses, to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the Old Testament because, see, there is no way to the Father except to the Son. And Jesus Christ in Colossians 1 has preeminence in all things. He was the first one that made the resurrection from the dead. Uh-huh. Okay, so it was critical that Jesus go to them, preach and present to them the gospel. The gospel. And then they participated with him in his resurrection and came and showed themselves to many dead saints. So everyone who's ever lived gets the same opportunity. I would like to believe that. Yeah. I really would. And my personal opinion, I would like to believe that everyone, just as those Old Testament saints, had an opportunity to accept or reject Jesus. Didn't Romans, in Romans, I thought I read that it said that God had waited to judge those people until the sacrifice. I've, I think I read that. Yes, I wish I knew that. He, they didn't have a way out, as Gary pointed yeah, out Yeah, God earlier. waited, to, like he waited yeah. to judge them or whatever. Right. Waited on judgment. And so a believer that dies, it's the same thing, right? What? Now, they they to, don't instantly go to... Today, uh, it is different. Because, see, today we have to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the so Lord. So you're with Christ, but you're not in final heaven, right? Well, no, today there is, and, and that let me clarify maybe what you asked a while ago. At the moment of death right now, a Christian goes to heaven. Okay. Okay, right now. Uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So anybody that has any Christian believer that's that's died... They're in heaven. They're in their reward. Um, the non-believer goes to a holding place. Holding place, yeah. Waiting. And one day there'll be an eternal judgment. Yeah. It's called the white throne judgment. Yeah. And in, if you will, in Revelations, it tells us that all the dead will appear before the judgment. And those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into the lake of fire. I want to say this before we get to our guest and it's a conversation I had with you before we were going out and I was really in my struggle and I was like, I was like yelling at Larry. I was mad. I could, you, you wouldn't understand why I was like, why are you okay with this hell thing? I said, why are you okay with going, people going to hell? Like you seem like you're happy about it and stuff. And, and Larry goes, why do you think I do this? And it clicked with me. I was like, why else would we do this? That's it. Why else would we? That's why we're doing this is because hell is real. And I want to spend eternity with my friends. You know what I mean? I really do. So as pastor said, guys, God does not send people to hell. He gives them a way out. Yeah. It's up to them to choose that way. out. He's done everything possible to keep them from going. And then they send me. I mean, you know, I ask God every day. Here I am. Lord, send me, send me. And he sends me out to invite or to spread seed or to, to whatever he, he does. But we do have an enemy. That's the biggest thing is um, we do have an enemy. I don't know why. I don't know why we have an enemy. I don't know why it can't just be easy to follow God. I don't know why. Um, but unfortunately, we have an enemy. We have an enemy, and we have, to, we have to battle that every day. And without the Holy Spirit, you're cooked. Without the Holy Spirit, you're done. Yeah. Like you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. So I hope um, I hope that clarified some things and we're going to move forward um, from here on out. And we're going to move forward um, and getting back on the mission of the ministry, you know, and um, like I, I said, be strong in the Lord. I used to I used to run in the dark and I used to scream at Satan and say, I'm coming. I'm kicking in your front door. I'm coming to get your people. And I'd like to renew that. OK, can I today. say something? And surely I wore the shirt you sent me. Thank you. All right, there we go. All right, we're good to go. We're good for our guest. Okay. All right, so today we have a man named Justin, and his online name is Deconstruction Zone. Um, I have stopped by and seen him. Um, He's got a fairly uh, popular, he's a real nice guy, it seems like, Um, so I'm very excited to talk to him today. Um, I think he was a former pastor or, or... or he was going to seminary or something, and so um, we're super excited to talk to him. Have we connected this thing yet? I didn't think about that. I didn't so I connected it with your hand. You gotta be tough. We're pink, don't you? Why we're in the middle of 
Why? So what I got something on it? Hell is, and people going is our will and our, our free will because things are they are not God, right? Yeah, that's yep. That's it. Um, so can you turn the volume up on the phone? Check my volume. Zach. I got it. I know. Check the volume button on the phone is what I'm saying. I will as soon as it comes up here. Hello, Justin. Justin, it's Zach from Help My Belief. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing good, Zach. How are you doing? Not too bad. Sorry, I think I think I just had a mini stroke there. It's Zach from Help My Unbelief. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was. Don't worry. Uh, so let me let me. Um, I I don't know how. Uh, have you ever watched the show before? Um, I've watched one or two uh, episodes, but I'm not incredibly familiar. Okay. Well, let me go over the show with you. I don't know why I ask people that. Even if you say, yes, I've watched every show, I'm going to go over the whole thing anyway. So, um, That's right. But let me, let me go over it with you. So um, here's how it works. We're going to interview you for about an hour. Um, mm -hmm. So about 45 minutes is what we're going to do. We do about 45 minutes. Um, and what we do is we basically just talk to you about your story. Um, we are not a debate platform. I've watched some of your lives. If I were to debate you, you'd probably kick my tail end in. And so that's not what we're, <laughs> that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're here for. Um, we're a platform basically to just kind of listen to you. Um, because we do notice a lot of people are leaving Christianity and we just kind of want to, we want to understand better of why sure. that's happening. And so, um, yeah, we just want to get your story. No debates. Um, I'm sure, I mean, if something happens and, and, you know, we talk about our experiences and it gets a little debatey, we'll shut it down. But what, so some of that's allowed, obviously just decent yeah, conversation. Yeah. And then at the end, um, we have about 20 minutes, um, where we do something called the final rounds and it's where everybody, um, in here will, will, will get to go around the table. It's basically just me and Larry today. And then we have pastor Gary in here, a uh, special guest today. And we, uh, we'll do the final rounds where we say one little final thing. And then because you're our guest, you're going to get the final saying at the end there. Oh, sure. All right. So, okay. Well, sounds good. Let's just get started. So the way I understand it, that you were, you were, um, you're an agnostic atheist, right? Yeah, I think that's the best description because I think, you know, from an honest standpoint, there are just things that we cannot know. Um, and so if there's something we cannot know, like the, the origin of all space, time and matter, then theoretically that makes you an agnostic. <laughs> right. Okay. Didn't I think uh, somebody I was talking to a couple weeks ago that, that uh, they were a Christian admitted they were agnostic to some things or something like that too. And that kind of shocked me. Um, yeah. Mark I, said he's an agnostic toward hell because he can't prove. That right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think if you really press people on both sides of the spectrum, everybody falls into some level of agnosticism. Some people, you might be, you know, more towards like, there's a lot of things I don't know, and I'm okay not knowing it. And some people feel like they know almost everything, but not quite everything. But there's always something, right? Right. So I'm okay not, not knowing some things, but I am at least fairly confident that um, any of the the religious notions of God, especially like the Abrahamic notions of God, I just don't feel like any of those things are adequate, and I'm pretty comfortable in my own position stating that, yeah, I'm pretty, uh, I would say, atheistic towards those particular models of God. Okay, and so you were in seminary at one point, right? You were studying to be a pastor? I, well, yeah, I completed my, my MDiv, so I did... Um, I did an engineering degree, so my background is in robotics. And then I went back to school. I went to two years of Bible college, and then I did three years for my MDiv. And that's and master, neither one master of div divination, correct? <laughs> yeah, the master of divinity. divinity, yeah. Divinity, okay, yeah. sorry. And then, like, what, you know, um, what, what, like, uh, um, um, what do they call that? Denomination was that? Yeah, good question. So the Bible college I went to were considered bitter missionary denomination, uh, not to be confused with Missionary Alliance. Do you know what that is, and Pastor then, Gary? Mm, no, I'm not familiar with that. Sorry. 
they're they're not huge. Uh, they're not a really large denomination. Um, Say what it was again. It's just the they just call themselves the missionary denomination. Oh, um, okay. Let me see if what they're, they're based out of. But a lot of people confuse them with the Missionary Alliance, which is kind of big. Okay. So when so when you when you were in um, school, were you like a hundred percent in? Like in into yeah. God, like you were in. You didn't have like you didn't really doubt that much. Like you were just completely into it. Yeah. Well, I never. So when I was in was in Bible college, I didn't have any doubts about God. I had lots of questions um, about the biblical text because. So, you know, precursor, I I did 12 years in the Catholic school system before I went off to college. So I actually had a pretty good handle on the biblical text. I knew most of the stories. I had already read a lot of them. I I went to a pretty decent Catholic school that actually made you read the Bible. Um, And we studied the history and whatnot as well. So um, I had some questions about the text, um, but I didn't have any questions about God going into it. Gotcha. Um, before I went to Bible college, I did read some books on textual criticism, because that's always been like a favorite topic of mine. Um, you know, so some of the early stuff, um, from like, you know, really light work, like FF F. Bruce and Bart Ehrman, those will kind of open the doors to, to asking some of the bigger questions. And I think I wrestled with the bigger questions after I graduated from Bible college. Gotcha. Did you, do you think at that time that you had like a relationship with God, like outside the academics, like outside all the Bible stuff, did you have like a, a relationship with God where you spoke to him in prayer and stuff like that? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I was kind of a sold out type of guy and part of that personality, you know, some of that's kind of genetic. Like I don't really do anything halfway. Uh, but I was completely sold out for God, and I and you know by all accounts I felt that you know um, it was my calling to go to Bible college and to go to seminary because I felt you know I, I would find a lot of the answers to my questions. I would be able to use my my knowledge and my resources to help bring other people to to Christ. And so um, you know all throughout my twenties and even my thirties, you know I was involved in in various churches, uh, doing, uh, you know, mission trips, uh, leading, uh, youth groups, young adult, young adult groups, preaching on Sunday, um, teaching Sunday school. Um, uh, there's never a question about, um, I, w- I would say even as I started to question different things about the Bible, I don't know if I ever really questioned God's existence or or the fact that I had a relationship with God. I viewed those things as somewhat separate. Uh, you know what? I kinda, I kinda identify with that. Like like I, I that's why I was talking to Pastor Gary before is like um no matter what happened, no matter what questions I had with the Bible, I feel like I always have that um relationship with God. Like I've always feel close to him. So I kinda identify with that. So what what started the um the slip away for you. Is there one thing in particular that was like a turning point for you or was it a combination of things like in your mind, in, in your memory, like what was the turning point for you? Well, I, I think there's a, there's a probably a maybe four or five different things that started to, I would say kind of stack up. Okay. Um, and I think one of the things I had to really wrestle with was, you know, the more that I studied the Bible, the less reliable and the less believable it became. And so, you know, I studied the Old Testament both in Bible college and in seminary. That was my primary focus. And I, I specifically wanted to study the historical context. So I, I studied uh, uh, as much Hebrew as I could. Obviously, I was forced to learn Greek. I did Greek too. But then I also did Akkadian and, um, and then after school, I did a little bit of, uh, of Ugaritic. But uh, the fact of the matter is, um, throughout my time studying the Old Testament, it, it kind of, it, it was alarming to me, um, the type of God that you find in the Old Testament. And some of the laws that he gives his people, <laughs> the way that he, he wishes for them to live, 
it was pretty alarming. And the fact that uh, I think one of the big issues too, that popped up, I've got four sisters and I would never allow somebody to treat one of my four sisters the way that God treats women in the old Testament. They're, they're essentially one step above cattle. And so I really struggled with, with the God. Basically, if all you did was read the first five books of the Bible, you would come away thinking that this is a God who does not believe that women are actually equal to men. And um, lots of other rules in the Old Testament were really difficult to wrap my head around. And I think that was the first time I started to think to myself, you know, there's some there's some foundational issues with the character of God in the Bible. And then, but like you can move beyond that. There's a, there's a hundred ways to rationalize why a good God would do bad things. So I did what everyone does and I rationalized it. And, but then other problems start, start coming up. Uh, so for example, I studied uh, a lot of textual criticism in school and I found a lot of issues with the manuscripts because one of the issues I had was studying the New Testament. You know, I was really always concerned with how the New Testament authors um, approached the Old Testament text. What was in the mind of the New Testament author when they were reading the Old Testament text? And, and when the Old Testament author wrote the text of the Old Testament, what were they thinking? What was in their mind? What was the, the goal of the stated text? And the problem that I kept running into is you can't answer those questions. Those questions are not answerable because we don't have any stable textual tradition for the Old Testament. Um, a lot of people will say, well, you know, the Greek Septuagint is the oldest, and therefore it, it should be most re reliable. And that's what the New Testament authors quote from. They never quote the Hebrew text ever. They only quote from the Greek text. But even if you say, okay, well, fantastic, let's look at the Greek text. You've got a myriad of problems there. You've got about six different recensions of the Greek text, and they don't agree with each other either. So I can compare the Theodosian with the Achaea, and I can compare it to the, the Hexapla, and none of them agree, even on like some core passages. And so for me, textual criticism was a little bit problematic for me because I kind of got to a point where, you know, if, if you really want to know what the Old Testament says, you can only get to um, an estimate of what it says. You cannot know for sure what it says. And yeah. it also beca became pretty clear. And that's the other thing too, about like the prophecies. A lot of the prophecies hang, like the, the way the New Testament authors treat the Old Testament, they hang on like one interesting grammatical anomaly. There's like one particular word that just isn't situated normally in the text. And then they create this whole theology based around this interesting, secret word that was placed here that seems out of place but the fact of the matter is it probably just crept into the text by accident you know what i mean pastor gary but anyways pastor gary so um i'm not really like i can tell that he's been to bible college and i haven't is basically he's <laughs> yeah. saying a lot of things well, where i can tell yeah do, do you understand what Justin's saying and like um, his problems that he kind of ran into in college and, and have you ran into those problems? Do you have a solution for any of them or a solution? No, but I do understand a little bit of what he's saying. And I do. Okay. Uh, honestly, uh, Justin, this is Gary. Hey Gary. And I, my only question would be, do you feel like you ever had a intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Yeah, of course. And did you ever communicate that type of a relationship? I, I heard you say something about working with uh, youth and teenagers and preaching. Um, mm -hmm. Was there ever, you know, a time in your ministry where there was the emphasis on being able to, you know, communicate to them the importance of that personal, intimate relationship with the Lord? Well, of course. I mean, that's the whole the whole thrust of of teaching. Uh, the church is to help them to draw closer to God. Yeah. And, um, you know, th to be perfectly honest, you can do that. You can be, you can be a minister without it, almost no Bible education. If the whole goal is to teach people how to communicate with their creator and, and to, um, 
you know, follow Jesus Christ. Um, I mean, you, you can just be a normal everyday Joe and read the Bible and figure that out. Um, so, uh, you know, my, my study of the Bible, I don't think was something that I really put into my ministry all that much. Nobody in my ministry cared, you know, whether or not snack rib, you know, conquered the Israelites in 605 or 587 BCE, that wasn't relevant to them. Um, but yeah, you know, honestly, as a Christian, I, it was a relationship to me. And I understand that academics and people who go through the system get kind of characterized as um, having an education, but not a relationship. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of an unfair characterization of most people who've gone through the system. Um, almost everybody who is a liberal scholar today was once a conservative Christian that grew up thinking that they had a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're not ones to tell you that you were a fake Christian or you didn't do it right, by the way. Like, I know I know a lot of you guys were like, well, you never were a Christian. And that's one of my top five hated things. Because I know, I know we've talked to a lot of people over the last 60-some episodes and it sure does sound like that they were practicing um, to the best of their abilities, just like just like we are. So we're not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna disqualify your relationship. We're we're simply asking to kind of understand because this is. You can imagine this kind of stuff is kind of hard for us to hear. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. And honestly, um, <laughs> they don't have to be polar opposites. Um, it right. doesn't have to be a polar opposite of relationship or knowledge. Right. Yeah. You right. know, I, I think they can come together. And of course, from a perspective of a believer, uh, I believe they do come together. Um, sure. But there's such a thing as being able to, st- you know, and, and again, not debating or being critical, but there's such a thing as studying to disprove and studying to be able to find things that contradict or studying to build be- belief, to build faith. And, and sure. of course, there's so much out there that you can study for the objective of finding fault or finding something to, you know, to question or doubt. Or you can study and say, okay, I want to build my faith. I want to grow and, and I want to develop that faith. Sure. Yeah, of course. And, you know, obviously someone who, you know, I spent, um, you know, five years of my life in Bible college and seminary. Um looking to strengthen my faith, to get a better education, to equip myself for ministry. Um, not because I was looking to disprove the Bible. I, I could have done that from my couch. You know, I, I could have got on a, a, a website and found all the information that I needed for that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, my goal in higher education was to, was to get more answers to my question. In fact, I've got a twin brother who went to Liberty University. Um, and when he finished school there, he didn't go into ministry. And I never asked him about it. Um, cause I, I knew, you know, like me, he had an education prior. He, he's an IT. Um, but I asked him about it maybe two years ago. And he said, honestly, when I went to school and studied the Bible, I discovered that I had a lot more questions and a lot less answers. And things didn't really add up. You know, I didn't really, I didn't tell anyone about it. I didn't make a big deal about it. I still believe in Jesus. I still believe in God, but um, I'm not comfortable getting up in front of people and teaching the Bible to them because I don't think that the Bible is all that, all that clear. Um, and to be honest, I think that's kind of what a lot of, a lot of people run into when they start studying the Bible. They run into a lot of things that are problematic that can't just be easily wished away. And I know for me, you know, one of the the earliest big issues for me was the manuscript evidence. Uh, The idea that you just really cannot know what was in the foundational text. And the fact that the New Testament relies on the Old Testament is somewhat problematic. And then uh, I, I would say two other things along my journey that were problematic for me, like really problematic for me, um, when I was in my first year of Bible college, I had a friend who already completed her degree in biblical studies. We ha- and we must have had about four or five people in our Bible study, and um, 
you know, we were kind of talking about, you know, what are some of the better ways to, to witness to others about, about the faith? Like what would be something you could say that, what, what could you show to them that you could say, Hey, listen, you know, there's some validity to Christianity. Maybe you should check it out. And I said, well, you know, it's really impressive that Jesus completed, you know, all the prophecies uh, that were listed. And she looked at me like I had three heads and she goes, I, I don't think he fulfilled those prophecies. And I'm like, I'm sorry, excuse me, what? And she goes, really, I don't, I don't think that he did. And uh, she goes, I want you to go home this week and read every prophecy listed in the Gospels. Go back and read the full context in the Old Testament and tell me what you think about it. And I did. And the, you, you read the first one and it's kind of alarming. Like, oh, yeah. You know, Isaiah chapter 7 has nothing to do with the virgin birth, nothing to do with Jesus. There's no future future prediction there. It's clearly a sign for King Ahaz 700 years before Jesus. But you're like, you know what? Maybe it's just a like a typological fulfillment. That's fine. We can roll with like a typological type of fulfillment. Then you get to like Isaiah, I'm, I'm sorry, Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, where it says, out of Egypt, I have called my son. We're like, that's not even a prophecy. What, what's he quoting there? There's nothing there to even be fulfilled. And I went through the prophecies of the Gospels one by one, thinking, eventually, I'm going to land on one that is just like an undeniable prophecy where God says, I'm going to do this, and the Messiah is going to do this. And I could go to the New Testament and say, look, Jesus did that thing. But there's not one. You can't point to a single prophecy in the New Testament where the Old Testament prophet literally just says, the Messiah is going to do X, Y, and Z, and then Jesus does it, because there ain't none. Do you remember any, um, do you remember like anything spiritual that ever happened to you while you're on your walk? Like something that you, like whenever it happened, you were like, oh, this is God talking to me. And then now you look back at it and you, you just think was silly or something. Yeah, actually there's quite a few of those experiences. And I think it's one of the reasons why I stayed in the space uh, or I stayed, um, as like a believer in God for so long, even after I was kind of okay, admitting that I don't believe that the Bible is truthful. Um, cause I've had a couple experiences along the way that I'm going to say are, they're very difficult to explain. Can you give they me are one? very difficult. Yeah. So um, early on, I think one of the things that led me to Christianity when I was, so I told you I was raised in the Catholic school system, but I didn't go to church. I didn't come from a Christian family. It was just kind of um, a situation that I was uh, I I knew about because I was raised in the Catholic school. But I took my walk, uh, I took my faith seriously during my teenage years. I started to become more interested in the Bible, and I started to become more interested in um in becoming like a real Christian, not just like some kid who went to a Catholic school. And um, i tell you, I, I started going to church with my best friend, Kyle. His parents were evangelical Christians. I went to church with him for a couple of years um, just because like we spent every weekend together, right? So I started to take things seriously. And I remember at one point, I started to try to kind of clean my life up a little bit spiritually, uh, thinking, you know, I'm old enough to start taking this seriously. And, um, but I had like, a, I had, a, even at that age, I had some questions. I had some doubts. Right. I didn't really know. I didn't know much. You know, you, as a teenager, you think, you know, a few things, but you don't know anything as a teenager. But I do remember <laughs> my, my dad told me, he said, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you have all the answers because my dad studied the Bible apart, you know, kind of part time with his pastor and his pastor had a Ph.D. He was no dummy. Um, but he's like, like, you just have to be OK in knowing that you're not going to have all the answers. And he was OK with that. And so he said, but the key is, you know, you just have to you have to have faith. And if you have faith in God, you know, he'll show up, you know, he'll prove to you that he's real. And so when I was 16, um, I had a really nasty back injury uh, resulting from 
uh, teenage stupidity. I got a football injury, and rather than taking a break, I went right into football season and the wrestling season. Then I hurt it twice as bad. And the, so then I, I had this really nasty back injury that I had months and months of therapy for. Didn't really go away. It plagued me for, for quite a while. Um, and I remember um, I had a night where I was like, you know what? This is really annoying. This is very frustrating. Um, I, you know, my dad watched TBN on Sundays. I'm like, well, maybe these crazy preachers on TBN talking about healing, maybe they're telling the truth, right? And so I prayed. I said, listen, God, if you're real, I, I need help here. You know, my back screwed up. I've had months of therapy. Nothing really seems to work. And football season starts in two more months. <laughs> yeah, so, I got to go. Yeah. And, and I went to bed. And I'm, I'm not joking. Before the end of that week, I was out jogging. Wow. So there, there are things like that that when they happen, you're like, I, I don't have an answer for these things. You know what I mean? When you're young, you think that the answer is what you know. Like if you're part of a faith, you're like, ah, it must validate my faith in whatever it is, whoever I thought I prayed to. Um, now, the interesting thing, though, is I have friends of other faiths, and I got deep, deep into apologetics in my late teenage years, like 18, 19, and in my early 20s. And I would engage with people of other faiths because I was really convinced that, like, healings were a, a really good sign, like miracles and healings were a really good sign that Christianity was true. And the, the problem that I ran into is as I made friends who were Muslim, as I made friends who were Hindus, as I engaged in various forms of apologetics with them, I discovered that my story wasn't that unique. A lot of them had very similar healing stories. Some of them completely unexplainable, some of them completely miraculous. And that, that alone did, wasn't enough to like persuade me by any means, but it was, it was like a data point. Like, okay, something could have happened. It could, it could even be a miracle, but it does, is it a demonstration that my specific religion is the one true religion? I don't think it is. Right. Does that kind of, is that kind of disappointing to you when you look back at that and you probably felt a lot of excitement? Do you feel disappointment that, that, that you don't believe that that was God now? How does that make you feel? No, no, I, I don't think so because I don't have any, so I, I know some people do, but I don't have any bad memories as a Christian. I, I don't have, I never had a bad experience with the church. Um, I've never been hurt by anybody in the church. Um, and so like when I look back on my experience as a Christian, like I have fond memories, like it, it, it's happy times for me. Are you grateful for um, your time as a Christian? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, because for me, you know, as a teenager participating in Christianity, the way that I did, honestly, it kept me out of trouble. I, I didn't do a lot of things that I probably would have done um, if not for having some of those religious convictions. Because, I mean, if you have teenagers, I don't know if you do, teenagers are crazy. They do all yeah. kinds of <laughs> dumb things. Yep. And so, you know, personally, I, I felt, even now looking back on it, I'm, I'm okay uh, with the understanding that, you know, part of my development as a young person, part of my coming into maturity as a young adult, I'm okay crediting a lot of that to kind of the, the teachings of the faith and how they were applied in my life and surrounding myself with, with other people who encouraged me to walk in ways that were beneficial yeah. and not ways that are, are destructive. What if, uh, what if it's true though? Cause you know, you, you've been there long enough and you know, there's some pretty dire consequences. If what we believe is true, there's some pretty dire consequences of being wrong, I guess you can say. Like, what if it's, does it worry you sometimes? Because I imagine ex-Christians, it could worry more than what somebody that never was a Christian because you, you know the realities of what happens at the end. 
And so yeah. do you, do you walk around and does it ever pop up in your head and you go, Oh man, what if I'm wrong? Does it worry you? I would say so early on uh, when I was in seminary. Uh, so by the time I was halfway through seminary, I, I was probably, I was already kind of toying with the idea of like, I'm not really sure if I really am a Christian. Like if I take a look at what I actually believe, and what mainstream Christianity believes, like I might be borderline, you know what I mean? Right. And so I, I did at that point start to consider, well, what what does that really mean? Is God going to send me to hell if I don't believe what mainstream Christianity believes? I don't know. That seems like a barbaric God to me that if I don't believe things completely right, despite all my education, that he's going to cast me into hellfire for all of eternity. That doesn't make any sense. And um, so I, I have wrestled with that. Now, I would say uh, at this stage in my life, um, absolutely zero uh, percent fear of hell. Um, if, if there's a God, um, I refuse to believe that he would uh, make someone suffer for all of eternity or send them to annihilation or whatever your theory of hell is, or, you know, eternal separation from God, he's going to do that merely because you don't believe something. Now, uh, it's also true that this, uh, this idea that like, if, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, that, you know, he is the only way that you're going to go to hell. Like to me, that's just completely incongruent with the God of the old Testament. So now, I kind of like, you have to pick and choose. Do I believe that the God of the Old Testament is true? Or do I believe that that Jesus is teaching in the New Testament is true? Because you won't find eternal torment in hell anywhere in the Old Testament. The closest you'll get is Daniel chapter 12, where it talks about the final resurrection, where it says everybody will be resurrected, some to eternal, uh, you know, eternal life and some to eternal shame and torment. That It doesn't say anything about hell. And it doesn't say it doesn't say why, but if you actually read the Old Testament, it's quite clear that the reason why some people are given eternal life has nothing to do with because they believed uh, the right thing and everything to do with whether or not they lived a life um, that was pleasing to God. You know, they took care of the widows and the orphans and the poor. And they, you know, they walked humbly with God, and um, they lived a life uh, that was righteous. Um, and so. I personally, even if I'm wrong, um, I, I still have the problem of, like, well, I don't even know if the people in the Bible are, are right, because in the New Testament, people kind of seem to have a fundamental disagreement with the Old Testament people. So, like, what if Paul is wrong, right? So right. If, if, if Paul and Jesus are wrong about hell, um, then I would imagine – that um, God would not be punishing them for, for having a wrong doctrine. Um, and I, I certainly can imagine that I'd be punished for making the same error that, that they made. And I realize that sounds incredibly blasphemous for someone to tell you that Paul and Jesus misunderstood the Old Testament. But um, from my point of view, um, I, I don't see any congruency with the the Old Testament afterlife and the New Testament afterlife, uh, the New Testament afterlife um, doesn't seem to be uh, anything similar to what we find in in the Old Testament. So I, gotta, and I sorry, I don't mean to yeah. interrupt you. Sorry, um, but I have a question in my head because I, I remember earlier it's been killing me. Um, you said that you believe for the majority of your twenties and your thirties. I've watched some of your lives. You cannot be much older than 35. How old are you? So I, I'm actually going to be turning 40 here in a couple months. Okay, so me and you are about the same age. I was going to say, you can't, you can't yeah. be that that old. I mean, you look, you probably look better than I do. You're taking care of yourself better nah. than me. My, like, my oldest I, daughter just turned 40. So when did you deconstruct? Yeah, yeah so, I mean, I, I've kind of been deconstructing for uh, you know, I, it, I deconstructed for over a decade, and I think the it took me a long time to get to the point where I was okay just saying to myself, 
I don't have to identify as a Christian anymore because I think everyone gets to a point where you know in your heart that you just don't believe it anymore. Like it's no longer believable, but you're still part of the faith. You're still part of the church because it's like it, it is now part of your culture. It's part of who you are, especially if you're in ministry. You don't want to be that person who um, who who goes from being a ministry to to, to and now was, yeah. telling everybody that you, you don't want to be that person. I didn't want to lead everybody out of the church. I spent, you know, the last 20 years trying to lead people into the church. I didn't want to now tell them that you need to turn around and leave the church. Um, so it was a big decision for you. It, it was a big decision and it was painful. And I think the best description um, that fits me and it fits a lot, because I've got friends who also went through a seminary who ended up in the same spot. And I think Bart Ehrman described it the best where he says, I didn't leave the faith because I wanted to leave the faith. I was drug away from the faith, kicking and screaming. And that's literally what it feels like. So every fiber of your being is fighting to stay in the faith. But at the end of the day, you have to be intellectually honest. You either believe it or you do not believe it. And that's what we were talking about there. earlier. That, yeah. that like unbelief. But I asked Pastor Gary. I don't ever. I don't know if we ever got um a uh, uh, clear on that. But so basically, what you're saying, we we had this conversation in the intro of the show was that you feel like your unbelief was something happening to you rather than a choice. Am I getting that cor- correctly? Yeah, because. Because you don't necessarily choose to believe something, you can you can choose to live in accordance with your beliefs. Like I could, I could believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior and choose to live a life that rejects that that Savior. But that's different than not believing. Um, so, like I cannot go outside tomorrow and believe that the grass is orange or that it's purple. Like I don't have that choice. Now, I could choose to live a life that says that the grass is purple, but that doesn't mean I actually believe that the grass is purple. And so that's what I mean with like intellectual honesty. Uh, at some point, you know, most people come to the point where they recognize you either do or you don't believe something. And it's hard to come to grips when you once believe something and you no longer believe it. It's very difficult to get to the point where, you're, where you could admit to yourself Hey, I just don't believe this thing anymore, and I don't know if pretending to believe it is beneficial. Right, and just like I was talking to Coco, Coco has a person that uh, that he has known um, that says they believe in God, but their actions are completely contrary to that. Right, right, yeah. So, like, right. like, yeah, I I don't think saying you believe in God is is good enough because we can all say we believe in God, but if your actions are contrary, just like if a person came up to me and punched me in the nose every day and told me he loved me, you know, like your words mean, <laughs> your, your words mean nothing to me like that. Your actions are showing me that you don't love me because someone that loves me wouldn't punch me in the nose every day. I've never hit you. Right. I love you. I back. can see it in your eyes. You want to though. <laughs> well, you are the same age as my children, so therefore right. I do sometimes want to correct you in love. And sometimes that involves punching me in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, <laughs> but yeah, that I, I mean, actions and words are completely, completely different. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I just yeah. we were talking about that earlier, and we truly do just want to understand. And I know most Christians attack you, and you've got to, you've got to admit that sometimes these people, these Christians that are coming into your life, um, that's not really a fair representation of Christians. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Well, so, yeah, so that's the thing is, you know, Christianity is a spectrum. And, um, it shouldn't, you be. know, it should, a lot be. of them are young. You know, a lot of them are young and they, they feel like, um, they feel like they've, they've, they've learned, they feel like they've learned something. So I, there's something that we used to refer to as the first year Bible college student syndrome. Are you familiar with this? No. Are you familiar with that, Pastor Gary? Uh, probably after I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first year Bible college student syndrome is when someone goes off to Bible college and they take like the first one or two hermeneutics classes. 
And in your first year of Bible college, one of the things that they try really hard to do is to to break you of your old ways of thinking because everyone comes with their already preconceived notions of what a passage means, what is the correct doctrine, what is the right way to read a text. And so when you start taking hermeneutics, they, they try to start with a blank slate and they say, listen, there you might have thought this text could only read one way, but look, you can actually read 10 different ways. You thought there was only one way to interpret this particular passage, but over the course of Christian history, we've developed 15 different ways to interpret this passage. So what happens is when you start getting through your first year of Bible college, you learn a lot and you also learn to start questioning everything. And you also start to believe that you know everything, you know more than everybody around you um, in the church, because the fact of the matter is you might at that point already know most more than most of the people in the church. But the reality of the matter is it's kind of like a Dunning-Kruger effect. You've learned just enough to feel like you know a bunch, but not nearly enough to realize you don't know anything yet. Yeah. And um, it kind of leads to this um, really annoying hubris. Um, but the good news is it usually wears off by like year number two or three. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And the drunk guys bother me the most when they come up in your lives. <laughs> the, the drunk guys that probably only preach the gospel when they're drunk. You know, just like <laughs> Pastor Gary said this a couple of weeks ago, he said, some Christians make me want to be an atheist. So, <laughs> Yeah, I, I get that, too. And um, so when I was a Christian, you know, I, I used to engage in a lot of apologetics. And but I understood that the very best witness for for demonstrating that your faith has power, for demonstrating that your God is real is to also demonstrate that that he is working through you yeah and that um that that whatever whatever that that holy spirit is he's living inside of you and he can be felt when you encounter other people and so um when i was a christian i would not dream of of going into a discussion with an atheist and flat out insulting them and invalidating their experience and calling them stupid, saying you don't know anything, because at the end of the day, you will never win somebody for Christ by by doing that. You just no. won't do it. No, I agree a hundred percent. That's that's why we do what we do. We just, I I don't even think it's. I, I say this a lot, but whenever a Christian tells somebody they're going to hell or something like that, I say that I left my book of life in my other pants. I just I don't think it's. <laughs> I don't think it's uh, my job to tell you where you're going. Um, you you know the Bible better than than me, so I don't need to tell you if you're sinning. Um, like I said, we just in love. We we want to listen to your story and and hear how you got to where you got and listen. I mean, that's our biggest compliment is that we listen. So okay, we're at those final rounds that we were talking about. So we're gonna go around the room and um, just say the final rounds to everyone um, here. So, Larry, you're up they first. They don't have a microphone. Start with Gary. Please. Okay, Pastor Gary. You start with me? Yeah, Pastor Gary, you get first. Hey, Justin, this is Gary. I just want to say thank you for the conversation today, and, and I loved what you said even about your past in Christianity, and that is as a teenager it helped keep your life in check and, and that you really had no problem and no hurt in the church. I loved hearing that. And... Um, the common ground that I have with you is, is a honestly not knowing. Uh, there's a lot of things that honestly, me personally, I still don't know, and I know that word agnostic many times is you know by definition is not knowing, and the reality even as a Christian, you know that you remember the scripture. I I think it's in Isaiah and then also in Second Corinthians, uh, Paul quotes it and he says, "I has not seen." nor has ear heard, nor has even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him, but they're revealed to right. us by the Holy Spirit. And so right. I haven't seen it yet, you know, hadn't even entered in my mind yet. I don't know it yet, but the Holy Spirit wants to reveal those unknowns to me. And so I, I want to thank you for being here today, and it's great to be able to just hear from you and and I hope you understand our heart. Our heart is just a heart of love to be able to communicate. Yeah, man, I absolutely appreciate that. Larry? 
Let me back up just a tad bit. You mentioned a verse in Hosea, and I don't know if I caught it wrong or not, but it, you said Hosea 11, and I'm thinking that might have been the verse instead of the chapter. Yeah, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, one and is two. quoted. Yeah, it's, it, it's quoted in uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses uh, 14 and 15. Okay, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. But the more right. I called to him, the farther he moved from me, offering sacrifices to the images of Baal and burning incense to idols. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's the one, yep. Okay, and the the I'm, I'm trying not to argue, but at the same time, I'm trying to understand, okay? So... Take it from that point of view. Yeah. I am not as educated as you are. Um, but I do firmly believe that there are different levels of understanding as we grow in Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's things that I'm never going to be at the level of Pastor Gary because as I'm trying to learn, Gary is also learning. And I'm learning from Gary. Therefore, he has more information than I have or I would not be able to learn from Gary. Is that not kind of clear? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I was raised in a church, but I walked away from the church. Uh, as a young man, seeking after my own flesh, we'll leave that alone from there. And one of the things coming back is that I do read verses now that had an understanding that I understood back as a child that don't have the same outcome now because I can apply it to my life differently. And one of them is Hebrews 11.1. 1. When we go to Hebrews 11.1, 1, we, um, I'm trying to find it real quick. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Is that faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen and gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Although I do not know everything by faith i can i can accept that there are things far beyond my understanding i am not the creator of this earth so i cannot tell you how this earth was created i cannot tell you how dirt came in or any anything else in that line and i'm okay with that but when you mention that jesus and paul must have misinterpreted the old testament it brings to mind instantly John 1, or John 1, 1, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in one fourteen, it says, so the Word became human and made his home among us. So that right there tell, tells me about Jesus. So there's no way that he could misinterpret what he actually was, because Jesus is the Word. The Bible actually right, but tells me that. So, not not to interrupt you, but do you but do you see how that that only makes sense, right? Is if you start with the presupposition that everything in the New Testament is true, right? If, so if you're an outside observer, right? Say, and I had an atheist friend challenge me to do this a long time ago. So he said, Justin, you're starting at the presupposition that everything in the Bible is true, and it's my job to prove it wrong. He goes, just open the Bible like an outside observer, like you're reading the Quran, and ask yourself, can I prove this to be true, or do I just believe it's true? And the New Testament, a lot of the stuff in the New Testament, you can't rationalize unless you start with, with the presupposition that Jesus is, in fact, God. But if you start with the presupposition that anybody is God, there's no end to what kind of uh, rational, rationalizing you could do with the text. If I start with the presupposition that Muhammad is, in fact, God, I could paint the New Testament to talk about Muhammad in about 10 different ways, even though he's not even in there, because I started with the presupposition that Muhammad is God. Therefore, the New Testament must mention Muhammad. So, Larry, wrap up, wrap up your um, your final things. All right, thank you, sir, for coming on. I appreciate you being here.
I I am a firm believer in the word itself being true. If sure. I, if I did not have that as the basis of my understanding and my belief, then I would have no belief. And when I, I feel that when people step away from the understanding that the Bible is true, then they lose their belief. I agree. I, I think it's, it's very difficult to remain a Christian once you've, once you've come to the conclusion that the biblical text is not reliable or that it, um, or that it's, it's got some, uh, some deep flaws in it. Even science proves that God exists. So why, well, I don't, why would God, I mean, I, okay. I, I don't, I'm, I don't I'm no, being flagged no, down. Okay. No, I get to done. stop there. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to say my final my final um, thing here. First of all, thank you for coming on. I've I've watched some of your stuff. I think you're very polite, um, unless you know sometimes those Christians get wound up, and so. Um, but yeah, sometimes I do too, but I'm trying to prevent it. You know, likewise. It says a uh, it says a lot uh, about us and um, our mission, and it makes me very happy that you would um, ch- share some of your time with us, and I appreciate that. A lot. I thank you so much for sharing some of your time with us. It's a lot of times you don't see this happening where Christians and um, unbelievers get together and they're able to share some common ground and and tell us your story. You got vulnerable with us. You told us how hard it was that um, when you and the choices that you had to make. And I actually learned a little bit from you um, in that that um, it was hard for you to make that choice to depart because I. I had said to Pastor Gary in the beginning of the show and Larry that um, that it that it would be hard for an atheist to come back in too, that that choice would be hard too because you have a community of people that you're with now that you would have to leave. And so just knowing that that choice was hard coming out, that, that helped me learn a little bit about what you were feeling there, and I know that must have been hard on you. Um, and... I don't know. And so my Bible verse that I was, um, that I thought of when, when everybody was talking there was the uh, first Corinthians 15, 14 through 20, that the whole mm-hmm. basis of our faith is the resurrection in Christ. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Christ is not, not raised. Yeah. Right. And so that, that for me is what I hang my hat on is if I believe that the resurrection happened, then Christianity is the truth. You know what I mean? Sure. If, if we could prove or disprove that, you know, then, that's what I hang my hat on is the, is the resurrection of Christ. And if he did, then, then we know that it's true. And neither one of us can, we don't have forensic evidence or anything else like that to prove it. We just have um, eyewitness testimony, which to me, that's, that's a lot, you know, um, there's a lot of eyewitness testimony, but like I said, we're not the, we're not the debate type. Um, we're, we're not doing that here. I, I just appreciate you, but you've got, Okay, you've got plenty of time here. Um, tell us your final thoughts of the t- of the day. Yeah, I mean, um, I've I've got a lot of thoughts, but I want to say that you know I appreciate what you're doing, um, but I I don't know if there's a lot of good open honest dialogue between um, current believers and former believers. I think the the relationship between the two groups. Uh, tends to be um, a little more volatile than what it needs to be. Yeah. And I think for obvious reasons, I, I think a lot of Christians um, are either offended by people who leave the faith or, or they're um, intimidated or sometimes uh, I, I've met some of them that are um, uh, e- even just kind of what's the word I'm looking for the fact that somebody could walk away from the faith after being in it for so long, after obtaining an education, it, it kind of scares them that they could be next. Right. So for a, a lot of reasons, there's a, a little bit of discord between the, the current believers and the former believers. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, it is not my goal to convert anybody to atheism. Um, that's, that's not my goal, but um, I do personally believe that truth matters. Um, and when I was in the faith, I spent my time, um, preaching and telling people what I thought was true. Um, because I believe that 
fundamentally knowing the truth is is good for humanity. So um, as offensive as it is for some Christians to hear me now preach a different truth um, that is uh, against the faith, all I can say is that um, I still believe that truth matters. I still believe that overall what is good for humanity is to believe as many true things and not believe as many false things as we can. And so um, I'll continue to do that. But um, if you guys catch me online, uh, feel free to stop in. I will. Um, if you, yeah, I mean, and, and if you come up with, with an interesting topic that you would like to flesh out, you're always welcome to, to come in my live and do it. In fact, I do a Monday night podcast with one of my good friends named Dan, who's still a Christian. And I, I have a, a completely non-atheistic presentation during that podcast. In fact, I go out of my way in that podcast to, to demonstrate where certain parts of the narrative, like we're going through Genesis, where certain parts of the narrative can actually be verified through history and archaeology and things like that. Um, so. I I'd certainly I still love researching things like biblical archaeology and things like that, which usually um, usually helps keep people in the faith. <laughs> um, they're right. still very deeply interesting topics to me, even if I'm uh, counted among the unbelievers. What do you so, think about that photo of Noah's Ark going around right now? Yeah, so I studied uh, the Noah's Ark situation uh, way back in 1999. Um, because my dad um, ran around in a couple circles uh, where Ron White's name came up. Because Ron White discovered that in 1986, I believe. Although he was the second person to, to go there. Um, so my dad brought it up. He said, hey, it, someone might have found Noah's Ark. And I was like, that's really interesting. So I started researching. And um, the Turkish government went behind and actually studied uh, the area and the rock formations and issued uh, a paper. Uh, they did so uh, twice in the 90s. Uh, one in the late 80s, one in the 90s. Uh, I think 1991 was the, the updated edition. And uh, I felt like the the documentation by the Turkish government was done by one of the, the universities. It was done very well. I think it clearly demonstrated that it was a, a natural rock formation and not, not a ship, not a boat. And um, uh, I personally, uh, it, like I looked at the geological survey of the area, I, I've personally seen similar rock formations uh, uh, surrounding that particular area that just happens to be the biggest one. Um, so uh, all that to say is um, I would love to see more excavation of it. I don't believe that it's an arc. I don't believe there's even wood there. Um, it, it appears to just be uh, limonite. And... But we are going to learn more. So sometime this year, the, the Turkish government, they've been preparing for the last two years. They kind of got behind because of COVID. The Turkish government is interested in actually completely unearthing this rock formation so that they can dispel uh, all the rumors or either confirm all the rumors. And they themselves have even said, listen, if this is a boat, even if we don't believe it's Noah's boat, which they would be inclined to believe it's Noah's boat since they're mostly Muslims and they believe in the Noah story. But they said, even if we don't know whose boat it is, even just discovering that it might be a boat, it's kind of a big deal. It could be a tourist attraction. We can make a ton of money. Yeah. And so <laughs> right. they're looking at actually digging, digging up that formation this year and doing a really in-depth excavation, picking it completely apart. And I think in the next couple of years, uh, there won't be any more arguments about what it is, whether it's boat or whether it's petrified wood. Um, I, I think all of those answers will be had shortly. I'm excited. What's your personal opinion on that? Oh, I think it's a natural rock formation. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we're at the end here. Um, Justin, thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, I will stop by and say hello every now and then. Hey, absolutely. Good to hear from you guys. Thanks right, for having brother. me. Take care. Thank you, sir. Have a great one. Right, bye bye. I want to bring up. I want to bring up something. First of all, welcome back, guys. <laughs> 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 oh. <sighs> Hallelujah. Welcome back. 
first of all, man, reminder how, how difficult this show is to do and to, you know, again, but praise the Lord that we get to do it. I was insulted when he said 1999, way back in 1999. Yeah. I was 37. Yeah. You, you had knee problems in 1999. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Larry had back problems and in he, 99. And he was about 45. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay, but um, I want to bring up something because um, I remember, uh, this has been a year ago, and I, 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 Pastor Martha brought up a podcast that she wanted to do. She said she brought up some number that the reason why Christians, she had read something that the reason why Christians are leaving Christianity is for a lack of discipleship, like Christians aren't being discipled. Yeah, and agree. ever since she said that, she was going to start a discipleship podcast and start discipling people through something like this. Instead of reaching out to unbelievers, she was going to disciple Christians, you know? Yeah. And she brought up that number, and ever since then, I've kind of had an undertone of any time like somebody brings up a story, I think of were they discipled, you know? I, I've been fortunate to have a brain to where I think it's because I'm, I don't know, I'm probably arrogant, prideful, a control freak, and all that other stuff to where I don't... Are you wanting don't... me to answer that? No, the, hold on, stop. I know what you or, think. Or I know you what you think. I know what you think. I know what you think. Um, but I think all that okay. stuff, and so, like, I probably won't, I don't, I don't allow people to disciple me just right off the bat. Like, I've got to know you. I've got to know that you care about this. Like, I've got to vet you, you know, and all this stuff probably... It's probably silly for me to be that bad, but like, it takes a little bit for me to do that. But, um, anyway, I was lucky in that regards, but a lot of people need, everybody needs to be discipled to grow because stepping in and giving your life to Christ, that's just the beginning. Your walk with Christ is a long process of growth, uh, pain, tears, joy. I mean, there's a big old long process and you, and you need, to, if it wasn't for this church, I would have done been uprooted out of your parable of the sower. I would have been on the rocks and been plucked out. Um, and I listen to these stories and Very I, well done by the way. And I hear stories of these people that come on or my friends or anything else like that. And there's a lot of undertone in that. And I'm not saying that's not why he's a believer, but he said something that clicked in my brain that whenever there was a girl that challenged him while he was in seminary to be like, hey, um, go prove to me that the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled any of the prophecies. She was ready and willing to spend time with him to disprove the Bible. She was ready. That's a discipleship for Satan, in my view, right? For lack of a better term. She was ready and willing to spend her personal time, her time to engage with him on disproving the Bible. That's why I want to set a challenge for Christians today. We need to be setting apart our personal time to disciple new believers in them growing in the faith. If you're not, then you're not being a Christian. You're not being a Christian. It's time to be a Christian. It's trying to, it's time to step up. It's time to disciple. It's time to get vulnerable and tell people your personal stories and help people grow in their faith because there is people that's willing to spend their personal time to disprove it. I personally have no clue how you can have a relationship with Christ and not talk about it everywhere. I mean, well, it happens. I mean, well, yeah, I just don't get it. You know, the quiet Christian, I'm, I'm, I, I, that, that's mind blowing. He put, he wells up in my heart to where I don't have a choice but to talk to people. Yeah. I well, mean, I don't, we need you, to you disciple. Know, you're, you're, you're pumping gas next to me, you're going to hear about Jesus. Or I wish Coco disturbed. had a microphone because you, you brought up the fact that you don't, that you didn't think somebody had, dis, was willing to disciple you. And do you remember, um, I'm right here, dude. No, long time oh, somebody ago. Somebody with more intelligence. Well, huh? I think we should disciple. I think we should disciple these people before they deconstruct. Yeah. yeah, I think we should disciple these people before they deconstruct. But you don't know when they're going to step into that pathway of trying to prove everything. How about the minute? They step into Christianity. We help them grow. That's one of the goals of this yes. church, right? It is. Is to help them grow, wouldn't you it say? Uh, Wednesday night, that's the time. That's the target. D definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's one of my, he disciples me through teaching. He discipled me when I first got to this church. 
I mean, I was with this dude over here every time I wasn't at work or tied up with Darcy. I was with him learning how to witness and getting just, he just constantly poured into me constantly. Mm -hmm. And he set an example for me that I hope I have met what he taught me Mm -hmm. by going out and being loud about the Lord where I am. Can I clear the air on some things real Mm -hmm. quick? Because I feel like I'm rude in your class, and I want to clear. I have some learning disabilities, mm-hmm. okay? And I want to tell you some things. I don't write. My whole life, I've had teachers be like, you better write this down or you're going to forget it. So for them, I would I would get a pen and piece of paper. I'm like, I want to make that speaker happy to make sure they know I'm learning stuff. And then I'd retain none of it. For whatever reason, I'd be focused on so much on writing stuff down that I'd retain nothing. And so I got to the point now where I was like, you know what? I think Pastor Gary's heart is that he wants me to learn. And I guarantee you, I would challenge the retention of your class uh, against anybody that writes it down. I guarantee I retain just as much, if not more. But I sit there and I move a lot and I shake my head and I don't say amen and I stuff like that because I, I, there's a lot going on for me to have to be honed in and focused to what you're saying. And I feel like it's kind of rude. To the, the speaker, but it's I want to let you know that's it's what not, I did. And okay. I appreciate that, but the reality is, is people listen differently. Yeah. And there's some people that are auditory learners, uh-huh. and some are visual, you know, right, and they have to participate. And so I understand 100%. They just want you to think I was being rude. Well, but, some, but to, some of us are old enough that we have to write it down so that we can look at it later so that we can remember what he said in class. And we'd like to really just have the whole daggum thing videotape so we can watch it 14 times so that we can retain it You're all. the first person I've <laughs> ever seen utilize your notes, though. Like, you literally do. Sometimes he'll be flipping back yeah. into episode 40-something just yeah. to remember. I mean... But to me, the critical thing in, in like talking with Justin is what is the heart and the motive in learning? What, what is the objective? Yeah. The more I study the word, the dumber I feel. I've said that over and over. Thank you. Because, I'm not alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The more I study, the more I realize I, how much I don't know. And in my personal life, I've read through the Bible a few times, and I read two chapters every day now. And I've read it cover to cover a few times. And the reality is, the more I study, the dumber I feel. And my heart is, I find things, I, that word agnostic, I don't know. I find out things that I don't know and I learn them. But I'm willing to learn. I could study the word and like, and it really goes back to what we said earlier. And that is you can study with the heart to disbelieve, the heart to find fault. Um, there's a lot of scripture that contradicts itself. And you can, you can look at all those errors in Scripture and f- try to find a reason for not believing, or I can study that word to find a reason to believe. Yeah. And that's the choice of the heart. That's why I always say this. The reason me. that I believe is in my heart. I feel, I've watched, I've seen, I've witnessed myself to the truth of what is in, in here. And for me not to believe is an impossibility even when I was at my lowest in my life to where I didn't live it. You, I would argue, I, I could have been drunk and ar- I would have been that dude. I could have argued drunk about the validity of this. And I mean, just argue that why can't you believe it? You know, I, I'm not educated enough to prove any points. I, I know more about the scripture now than I did then. But I'm also trying to love, not bash. But I grew up in the 60s and 70s where everything that we talked about in church was about hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. and we've moved away from that as a church with with and through love. And I, I appreciate it. But the truth is here. And if you don't believe that this is the truth, then that's where the beginning of the problems. That's again. Yeah, and that's why I always, like, the more people I talk to and the more that I really would recommend for some people at least, get saved, get the Holy Spirit, develop a close, tight relationship with God, personal relationship, before you start studying the Bible in depth, because the enemy's for sure, the moment you start having a relationship, you start studying the Bible, the enemy's for sure going to start telling you lies about God. Mm -hmm. And the more you get to know God, the more you're going to be able to discredit that. Just like my wife. I know my wife 
like the back of my hand. And there's nobody that's going to be able to come up to me and be like, hey, man, your wife was in this group of people and she was like lying a bunch. I'm going to be like, well, well, hold on. No, she wasn't. Like, stop. I know that lady. That lady doesn't lie, first of all. Like, I would defend her immediately because I know her, right? And that's why we have to get to know God. We have to get to know him personally. We have to dive into an intimate relationship before we start, before the enemy starts throwing lies at you. Because if you don't know him, of course he's, of course you're going to be like, is that true about God? Like, maybe it is. Like, get to know him and then let him self, let him prove himself to you. Because that's what she's done to me. Nobody's going to tell me she lied or cheated or anything. That's the best person I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm you kidding me? No, she didn't. <laughs> like I'll, I will, um, uh, defend her immediately. That's how we should be with God. Yep. Am I wrong about yeah, that? Actually didn't, isn't, isn't it Peter that actually tells us to always be prepared to defend, to give a reason for the hope that dwells within you. Yeah. Yeah. And it needs to be real. It needs to be not because you're a Christian or because some pastor told you to, right. you need to defend God because of what you've experienced with well, what you said is critical, Zach, in that you, have a personal relationship with the Lord prior to studying the word. Yeah. Because then you're studying the word based upon that relationship mm -hmm. and you're looking for Jesus to be revealed to you in his word. Yeah. Because I already have him in my heart and I already love Jesus mm -hmm. and I love Jesus so much that I want to learn more about Jesus. Yeah. And so you're not studying the word to disprove Jesus. You're studying yeah. the word to bring confirmation to what you already know and then when someone says well god god is all for you know being bad against women and stuff like this and well wait a second uh, not the god i know hold no. on like no he's not there's got to be an explanation for it. maybe you can't explain it because i can't i can't explain why that stuff's in there um but what i know is the god that i have a relationship with is not for that yeah. The, the fact that i know that the the person that does that to women that goes and stands in front of him someday We'll have to pay for that. Yeah. Right. But in the Garden of Eden, when God gave Eve to Adam, he didn't say, this is your slave. What he said was, this is your helpmate. This is your helper. This is, you are to be one with this. Yeah. And to me, that being one with, I, I could have never treated my wife as property. You know, I, I never yeah. could have. That, But that's my wife. She's got to do what I said. No, I, good grief. She wouldn't tolerate that at all. Yeah, she would whoop your butt anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I, do I have a minute to read Hebrews 6? Yeah, hold on. Do we, I have a minute to read I'm Hebrews give 6? You, yeah, I'm going to give you the ending real six, real quick. Hold on. But I want to just say that we got five minutes left, and I'm going to say this, and then you can close the show out. But I'm just, I'm so grateful to be back. I'm so happy to all of our listeners. We took that um, break, and I want to say it was crucial for the future of this ministry for that to happen. And I see what God did through that now. Um, we have a team of people. It's not just your boy, Zach, doing everything and creating this subpar um, attempt at going in the enemy's camp. Um, this is a well-orchestrated um, move to bring people back into the kingdom of God. And that's what it is now. So I want to say thank you to everyone for bearing with us in the break in the break and thank you for sticking with us and just know that if God has a plan and a purpose and he always has and it's never changed so um, well, I will argue in the future I don't want another break and I love you guys Larry never wants a break I, I never want a break I don't you slow down you stop you stop you can't get going uh, Pastor Gary any final thoughts before um you get to we get to Larry no thank you for letting me be with you All, always I love, you, man. I love you brother you know I'm always available if it was me I'd, I'd rather just be back there and have you right here yeah, yeah. No the kidding. truth I mean I, you're I, great at this <laughs> you and I you and I getting at this we you're love, not retired anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You're not yeah, retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot retire from yeah. loving God. Not at all. Very oh, um, at all. congratulations! I heard that you're going to be traveling around helping um, Assembly of God churches um, uh, rehabilitate Transition. after after losing a pastor. It's transitional pa pastor ministry. That's exciting. Churches that are in between pastors. So that just proves you can be retired from from your job, but you can never be retired from serving there God, you go. right? Because you, you seem, that's why another example is like you seem genuinely excited about this, about really? doing it. And you're retired and it's just like, and then I had the attitude of like, oh, I've got to go back and do this. And it's like, I see Pastor Gary 
that is an older gentleman that you've been through retirement of several different, um, and you're just so excited to serve the Lord. And I, I want to be like you. I want to serve God like you. So to see that attitude and see how you handle that at an older age and still is so excited to serve God, it really helps me have a different view on that. That's so great. thank you great. for say thank you for your walk. It's it's thank really you. helped me. So thank you. Larry Stop and think about it. Abraham was still being used at hundred and seventeen years old. Yeah. He was he was roughly hundred and seventeen when And you're he, still being used he, at one oh nine. When he <laughs> offered Isaac up as a sacrifice. You know? Okay. That was hundred and seventeen. Hebrews six. Go ahead. Green light. Go. Okay. Okay. Is this bad? All right, go ahead. Stop let us going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. For this is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God it is impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the Son of God. They themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. That's Paul talking about Jews that um, tasted the love of Jesus and then went back to it, huh? Yeah. Yep. Amen. Jesus loves you and so do I. Thank you for watching and listening. We are out. Thank you for watching or listening all the way to the end. To be a guest on the show or to get a hold of us, please contact us at info at helpmyunbelief.org. And more importantly, make sure to check out new episodes every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Central.